My name is Kosh, and I'm a creative director of many, many album covers. Uh, some I don't even remember, but I think I've produced about 2,000 in my, my career. It all happened by accident. I was actually working uh, way back uh, in the day, in the late 60s, for the Royal Opera and the Royal Ballet. And uh, it was very fashionable for rock and rollers to turn up at the Opera House mainly because they could sort of make notes about key changes and things and start, you know, incorporating Mozart into rock and roll, whoever, you know. With them. Uh, my luck came because I was working also at the time for a magazine called Art and Artists, and Art and Artists uh, was a very prestigious art magazine, and it was run by Mario Maya, who decided to go off to the Venice Biennale and run that, and left me in charge, which in fact was a big mistake, uh, because now all of a sudden I'm feeding, fielding the phones, and of course I'm talking to the great artists of the world, and of course the next thing I know I'm talking to John Lennon, because John and Yoko wanted to put a piece in the magazine, and um, <coughs> I got the phone call from John, and John said, uh, could he come and see me? <laughs> uh, and I, I was like, uh, oh really? I think this is somebody putting me on. This has got to be a, a joke, you know. But nonetheless, what's going to happen? The worst is you're going to end up in a pub having a drink. So, so I went, and sure enough, it was, it was John Lennon, and there he was, you know, like uh, uh, with Yoko, <coughs> and um, we got on really well. We had a cup of tea, you know. And the next thing is, happens, I was working on their various projects. The War Is Over project, which you know we have boats flying around Manhattan and doing all sorts of stuff. And I worked on their wedding album package. Uh, and then all of a sudden I found myself working at Apple as the creative director and it turned into the next album was Let It Be, uh, which got switched over uh, in the schedule to Abbey Road and all of a sudden um, I produced Abbey Road, which turned out to be the most iconic album cover and the most parodied album cover I think that one could ever possibly ask for. So anyway, that's, that's my sort of background before I broke into rock and roll um, in London. So I was working for The Who, Who's Next. <coughs> um, oh my God, T-Rex. I mean, we just did sort of a, an amazing amount of sort of bits and pieces that sort of uh, opened the gates, as it were, when I came to America and moved to the West Coast. And all of a sudden, the, the, the burgeoning West Coast rock scene was taking place. So, of course, I was now working for Linda Ronstadt, the Eagles, and... Uh, it, 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 that's basically how I sort of, you know, made the Atlantic Crossing. Rod Stewart made the Atlantic Crossing. I actually did the album cover for Rod Stewart's Atlantic Crossing. So it was all part and parcel of that sort of movement, uh, whereas the rock and roll business moved from swinging London uh, and sort of edged out towards New York and then sort of bypassed New York and came to Los Angeles. So I visited LA and I thought, well, you know, this is so nice, it's warm, it's November and I'm in shorts, I'm staying. And basically, this is how I arrived uh, at what we're doing now, um, which is basically, I, I guess, you know, the, the album cover's now shrunk to almost you know, impossible proportions. Uh, but there was a time <coughs> when you could walk into Tower Records and I would have like 10 records on the wall there that were in the top 100 and they're all mine. And that was a big thrill. And the biggest thrill of all, of course, is going on press and then watching like, uh, you know, 300,000 album covers coming off the end of the press, you know, that smell and that noise and that stuff, and it's all my work. So that was a, you know, that, that, would, that was a big ego trip. <laughs> <laughs> what, what goes into an album cover is different with every, every artist I work with, to be honest. Um, but yes, what we do normally is we plan out exactly what we want to do, you know, where the camera's going to be, where the lighting's going to be, uh, how the logo is going to work and be integrated with it. Um, and <coughs> some artists are different. Some don't really, really care that much, and others are very deeply involved, very deeply involved. Um, uh, Dan Fogelberg was a great friend, was a great friend, eh, so sad. <laughs> Um, yeah, we would just, you know, sit down and sort of, you know, work out precisely what we want to do and sort of, you know, uh, get into sort of arguments about how we're going to do it and how we're going to protect him uh, from the record company. Um, because the record company and he were at odds many times and my job was to be the bridge. So if anything sort of was delayed, I could blame Dan and if any, you know, or blame the record company while I in the middle was trying to sort out the model and get it looking together. 
with uh, somebody like Linda Ronstadt, who's still my pal. I just, I just finished her book, her autobiography, and, uh, and she just came out with a new album called Duets, uh, where she's singing with Frank Sinatra and a whole load of luminaries. Um, but, but she would actually just say to me, oh, I just feel like doing this. You know, I want to look serene, or I want to look kind of, kind of edgy and punk. So we come out with Mad Love, which you know was shot in a phone booth uh, while she was phoning Jerry Brown, her, you know, who she was with at the time, uh, by feeding quarters into the telephone booth, you know, because <laughs> this was before cell phones. Um, so we got that sort of urgent, sort of young look. But for something like Simple Dreams, which I think won me my, won me my first Grammy, uh, that was heavily planned out and drawn. Jim Shea was the photographer. He and I went to the Pantages, uh, to the ladies' uh, restroom, I guess is what you call it, the powder room. And there's all these wonderful deco mirrors around the place. So we actually had to map out precisely where Linda would sit so the reflections would appear in all, uh, in all the mirrors. Um, and, you know, the lighting wouldn't show and, you know. And that was like, uh, that, that took an awful lot of work to make sure that would, would work. And it really did work. It was actually one of my most spectacular pieces. <laughs> well, actually, it took three or four days to shoot that segment because we were setting it up and testing it, you know, with stand-ins, um, processing the film, pushing the, the pushing the film to see what grain structure we could get. Uh, and whether the colour values would be working and offsetting their fluorescent lights with our own lights. Uh, yeah, I took a three day shoot until Linda arrived at, you know, towards the end and we were ready. Oh boy, we'll be ready. You know. Abbey Row was like uh, a serendipitous album cover. Uh, <clears throat> the parent company, EMI, needed an album cover on Wednesday, and it's just, I think, maybe Monday. And the Beatles were scheduled to have a publicity session with Ian McMillan. And being the Beatles, and they decided, OK, we'll walk across the zebra crossing. We'll walk back across the zebra crossing. Da, 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 da. And Ian shot the, shot the shot. And it was down to me and uh, eventually to look at the, trend, the 12 transparencies and decide which one would make possibly an album cover. I'd already finished the Let It Be album cover, which was the black answer to the white album, because it was supposed to be their swan song. Um, so anyway, we had these 12 transparencies, and I said, well, okay, that's, that's the one that's gonna be, that works the best, they all look kind of good. You know, this is before computers, we can't fiddle with anything too much. Um, it, but apart from a little Photoshop, before Photoshop, for a little airbrushing on the sky to make it bluer, whatever else, we chose the picture. My claim to fame uh, was the fact that I decided that the Beatles was such a huge entity, we had no, there's no need to put the name of the Beatles on the cover. Everyone knew who they were. So I decided that it was gonna go out just with the picture, no type, no Beatles, no Abbey Road, bonk. Um, so we, we delivered the art and in, on time, because that's the whole point of this business, you can't blow a deadline. And at three o'clock in the morning, Sir Joseph Lockwood, the head of EMI, who is the parent company for Apple, uh, let off a string of invective and just told, just, just chopped me to pieces uh, for deliberately sabotaging uh, the next Beatles release. They're never going to sell an album. And he was so rude because he had this upper class accent. So it was, you know, it was even more devastating when he used sort of bad words, um, and they were really bad. Um, so eventually, you know, I just went to bed shaking because I was like so upset. And next morning, I turned up Apple and George, George Harrison was there. And I said to George, you know, I just got a call from Joseph Lockwood. And, you know, it's like he really like, really strangled me. <laughs> he said, oh, fuck it, we're the Beatles, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, this, you know, within three days, I sold 26 million. So I don't think I did any, any damage. <laughs> no, 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 I mean, the, the, the Abbey Road cover was totally, uh, totally happenstance. I got it right. Um, the, the, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the fact that Paul kicked his shoes off is because they were his sandals was because they were hurting him. You know, uh, that the Beetle um, Volkswagen Beetle in the background had yeah. twenty eight if on it yeah. was just because it was parked there. And I know the the, the law is that had Paul survived, right. he would have been twenty eight. You know, and the fact he's out of step. None of the, none of this was planned. You know, but the, but the point is that what actually sort of made all this work was the promotion and publicity um, uh, that sort of swelled up with it, with Derek Taylor, who was in charge of publicity and promotion at the time. And he would instruct everybody at Apple, you do not confirm or deny 
Paul's death, it is, you just say something like, well, it looks like him, and that's what we did. The traffic stopped because it was a pedestrian crossing. What are you going to do, run them over, run the Beatles over? <laughs> there are no subliminal messages in that cover. It is all serendipity. It all came together, but the one thing it did do was open the doors for me to come to the States, because you walk in and say, I did this, bang. Most of the work that I've been doing, I've enjoyed immensely. Some of my clients have been sort of difficult and some have been, you know, totally sweet and helpful and uh, supportive. And most of the stuff, um, I think possibly the Linda Ronstadt is possibly my closest uh, client. I mean, we have, we have done such lovely work together. We won three Grammys, I mean, you know, um, just from this wonderful sort of synthesis but the, the going on that we have with each other. You know, we don't finish each other's sentences and things, you know what I mean? Oh, actually, we do finish each other's sentences. Um, so that's good. I mean, the, the Rod Stewart was difficult. That was a difficult, um, you know, we almost came to blows at one point because the differences of how we, something would be done. Um, but nonetheless, when you look back at it, it's, you know, even the, even the, the calamities uh, are kind of funny now, you know, because it's like, in those days, money was no object. You know, because the record companies were probably breaking in millions and millions and millions, so you're spending thousands and it means nothing, you know. They're spending thousands of their money. Um, you know, you have to phone up Warner Brothers, Mo Austin, and say, well, I'm sorry, Rod didn't show up for the third day running and we've got all, you know, I've got all these models here, I've got a flooded hotel room, and he, he hasn't shown up again, you know. So, uh, you know, that's the excesses of, uh, of rock and roll at the time. You know. Uh, I've been working with Jimmy Buffett, I think, since 1976. He's a, he's a lovely man to work with. He has a very dry uh, sense of humour. Um, and uh, we've been planning, I, mean, I, think, I think Son of a Son of a Sailor was the first album cover I put together for him, where we sort of had him sort of uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a Roman galley as a sort of whole load of slaves oaring away, and he was in the back, you know, thump, thump, thump. thump. And we had Irving Azoff, his manager, the great Irving Azoff, you know, on the telephone. Oh, it's just madness, you know. Um, but yeah, I've been working with Jimmy Buffett for many, many years. And it's always a joy, always fun. And, uh, you know, we're probably going to start another one in a week or two, probably, because knowing him. The last one we did actually was great because he decided to go back to doing vinyl. Ah, oh, so now we've got the 12 inch square back again, you know. So, oh boy. And does it sound sweet on the turntable? Oh, yes. So Jimmy's like, you know, um, he's, he's ongoing. Oh, it's brilliant. Yeah, the, the, the fact that I had to do another, a 12 by 12 cover and I had to dig out my old templates from 1980 something to sort of do it, you know, it was a big thrill for me because it's like, oh my God, you know, people can actually see my work. <laughs> you think that could be a whole new trend? Oh, I, I hope it will be a new trend. I really do. I love vinyl. I mean, I've, I'm equipped with the... I mean, as you walked in, you didn't probably didn't notice the sort of the, the, the Torrens 150. I've mean, got all the stuff. The two <laughs> amplifiers, I've got everything. <laughs> and it, boy, do they sound sweet. <laughs> I mean, another iconic cover, I think, um, possibly is Hotel California, um, whereby I was, uh, I was phoned up by Irving Azoff, again, the, the, the manager, to come and listen to the title track. And as soon as you heard the title track, you, you just know this is going to be a massive hit. So um, the Don Henley uh, wanted to make sure that somehow or other we could epitomise the music in, a, in an image. So the photographer David Alexander and I went racing around town looking at various locations, one of which was the Beverly Hills Hotel, one of which was uh, the, was it the Green Hotel in Pasadena. Mm. I can't remember, but and it, was, it was the third one. Anyway, we happened to snap um, uh, uh, the Beverly Hills Hotel location and then thought about this a lot and then decided well, let's go and shoot it properly because in those days one would actually put the album cover together completely, totally finished to present to the artist. Um, so we got a cherry picker, we climbed up on the cherry picker and I know you can't pan up with the camera up there, the camera that took the picture. Um, and we shot the Hotel California, the Beverly Hills Hotel, in a sunset, and it was so gorgeous. It was obviously going to be the cover. Um, then we had to scout out the interior, which was in fact 
uh, the Lido on Wilcox, in, if you know your Hollywood. Um, and that was a flop house at the time, which we had to decorate and we just filled it with all their friends and whatever else they were gathered around. Um, and, you know, we got these beautiful dye transfers, they were all retouched. The neon lettering was in fact painted and inserted with the same film grain so it looked like the background and the whole thing came together and turned into uh, a, a nice piece of work. I must confess, I'm really proud of that piece. Today, uh, with all, with all the, the tools that we have, Photoshop, and um, it's much easier now because you can sort of come up with 10 or so ideas in an evening and explore them, you know, and throw out the ones that are not working, whereas before it would be a days, days before you trashed them, you know, because you, oh, this is not going to work. Ugh. Now it's, uh, it's gone. <laughs> um, but no, so it's a lot easier now to turn out, uh, you know, to actually narrow it down, even if you come back to your original idea, which quite often one does, because the first idea where you're driving is probably going to be the best, but you have to explore. So you do your explorations, but now you don't spend, spend three days exploring, you spend a few hours, you know, maybe three o'clock in the morning, but at least you know you're going to get to bed. Because when it comes to some, see the techniques now are so different. The Electrolyte Orchestra logo, which I designed, um, was a monster to do to prepare in those days because each color is cut out of a a, a, a frisket. You know, you have to cut the frisket and reveal the area you're going to airbrush. Um, so it's like a template for each color, and so you put it down and it works. You put it down, and the last one you're going to do. Oh, let's do the blue now, and it bleeds underneath the template, underneath your frisket, so it's ruined. So you've got to start all over again. Now, today with Photoshop, you can probably put that together in about two hours. You know? <laughs> so it's, a, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of a sort of, uh, yeah, it's liberating. But, of course, now the album cover is now a four-inch square, which is, like, frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the Electric Light Orchestra logo uh, was inspired, in fact, by, believe it, or not, it was sort of left from my childhood because my dad used to work for Wurlitz and jukeboxes. And uh, so as you can see, the arc of the thing is in fact the top of a Wurlitzer 1015. Um, so it's just a case of like, I started sort of getting involved in, you know, jukebox graphics because they're so kind of like crude in a sort of mo modern sort of deco way. Uh, so I started playing with those and the ELO in the middle looks just a little bit like General Electric logo, if you kind of think about it. So, I, you know, seeing the Electric Light Orchestra. So I started playing with their logo and then changing it to ELO and, you know, making it sort of shiny and gold and putting shadows on it and wherever else. But as I say, in those days, it was not something you just, you know, you sketch it out and get the approval with your crayons, you know, um, and get the approval, but the execution of it could take days, days and days and days to, to make sure that it um, kind of works, you know, but it did work. The second album that I was working on uh, for Electric Light Orchestra uh, was Out of the Blue, and uh, one day I was, pl I was playing frisbee with my, my, my young son, but I had stuck on the frisbee, I'd stuck the ELO logo, just because, you know, promotion departments, they all, every, you know, record companies all put out stickers and things. I stuck it on the logo and threw it into the air and I thought, wait a minute, there it is. There's a blue sky, there's a frisbee with a logo on it and it turned into the spaceship uh, that was out of the blue. So that's how that came about. It was just, that, that is true, pure serendipity when it comes to cre the creative process. Like, who would have thought? Oh, oh, you know, just, you know, I'm up to my knees in mud throwing a frisbee. Oh my God. Uh, so that's how um, that's how that happened. Uh, I've won three Grammys. Uh, they were all for, uh, working with Linda Ronstadt. Um, the first one was Simple Dreams, and somehow, or rather, though it sounds arrogant, um, I just sort of knew uh, that I was going to build a Grammy-winning piece. You know, one doesn't sort of set out to win Grammys, but you just you just feel it. You know, that, uh, it, it's going it's going to come together. Um, and then I think we did Get Closer, which is where she was wearing um, the red polka dot dress against a white polka dot background with a wind machine and all where else. I mean, printed it, it, it doesn't look anything like it used to because when we printed it, it was with metallic inks on the album cover. Now it's just, you know, red ink. Uh, but it was like glowed and sort of shimmered and all that sort of stuff. And that was really a pretty nice piece. And then Lush Life, which is... Uh, 
uh, the one where she's in a band box and you slide the band box out and she's inside it and wherever else and uh, uh, that was a nightmare for the printer because it all had to fit together and come together and sort of once you got it out you have to get it back in again you know so there was a lot of problems with that but nonetheless we sort of picked up a Grammy for it. Who's Next actually was another um, strange accident I mean it, it makes it sound like I don't plan much but you know there's been several pieces and most of the stuff you we work on is so is very rigidly planned but now and again happy accidents take place and Who's Next is, is one of them. Uh, because uh, the guys uh, were, <coughs> you know, drinking <laughs> and had to stop and they had to pee. And of course, there was these huge monoliths built along this dreadful wasteland east of London, w west of London. Um, and they just peed up against them. Um, but of course, this time it's like, t you know, the, 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 the movie t uh, uh, 2001 had come out and the monkey, the obelisk and whatever else. It did seem to sort of make sense, you know. Um, and uh, I think three of the pea stains are real. One's a cup of coffee thrown on it. Um, but anyway, it was just a sort of, you know. And then again, it was a case of picture of p looking at the pictures and Roger George is doing up his fly and that was kind of, you know, interesting. Um, the only thing that was wrong with the picture was the sky was just awful. It was like dreadful, dreary English grey sky. So I stripped in a blue sky, and this, as I say, it's before Photoshop, so it's actually done physically. And if you look at it carefully, it's really badly done. It looks like I did it with a, tooth a toothbrush, you know? <laughs> <laughs> which now is kind of cute, but at the time was like horrified me. Um, but anyway, so that's how that cover just appeared. It's just one of those things, like you know, like I'll just use this picture. It's good, you know. <laughs> I'll give you that. So I came to America with the Who the Next cover in my portfolio. And I took it to, I mean, of all the record companies I took it to, I think it was Casablanca and various others, they took great offence at this. And sort of, I actually won that. One, oh, one uh, label kicked me out because it was offensive and obscene. And I was actually out on the street with my album cover. Oh, you know. The other, Abbey Road, all those, didn't matter anymore. It was just this one was obscene, so I got thrown out. <laughs> it was like, you know, it's just so innocuous, you know, but nonetheless, I just got shit canned. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so I'm still working on album covers. I still have my clients, and I still have a, you know, an enormous amount of fun uh, putting images together and sort of, you know, sort of explaining exactly what's in the grooves, if you can still say grooves, because uh, that's the whole point, is you have to, you know, present to the public, and you may be also talking about impulse sales, which could be 15%. Uh, you're also presenting exactly what's in, in they're, they're going to expect, and that's a very important part. And also working and starting to work with younger artists, which is, I find, very exhilarating. And also, in fact, um, yeah, sort of s s challenging in a way, you know, because one has to sort of rethink. Um, so I enjoy that. I enjoy that process. It's like a process of recreation and um, whatever you can do to sort of like keep up, you know. Cause it's so in, in the meantime, I'm playing with my own original paintings and original art. Um, recreating some of my works from the past and presenting them in a new format. Um, some of the images that I've created way back are now sort of being resurrected and sort of worked on, particularly things that, you know, classic rock is so popular that some of the images that we can create um, now are sort of, like, you know, in a new fresh way, sort of are resonant with, you know, the younger people and the sort of the, you know, the middle age and whatever else who are sort of still like hanging on to rock, but they, they, they appreciate, you know, and they also are nostalgic for their art. But it's not pure nostalgia. I like the idea of pushing, uh, pushing the envelope. I'm working with a great painter called Bradford Stewart. Uh, who's a dear friend and he's a great abstract artist and we're um, amalgamating uh, our, our, our work together. His work t tends to burst out of the frame because he's like, you know, a crazy abstract sort of painter. Uh, so I try and contain it uh, with my graphics, but of course I can't and it bursts out. And I find that really exciting, that sort of like tension that we're creating together um, and enjoying ourselves. Okay, so some of my, my, new, my latest prints, which we're going to sort of uh, have ready on a website very soon, I'm also creating in 3D, where you can put, pop on your these rather sort of uh, beautiful and unobtrusive glasses, and all of a sudden everything leaps out of you and s slaps you on the face. And that's really good uh, using some of my graphics 
uh, to represent them in such a way that people had never seen them before. Uh, so I'm having a lot of fun, and not to mention, you know, spending a lot of time in the computer wearing crazy glasses. Uh, you're like, oh my God, I get these off. Um, <clears throat> but we've got this sort of system now where you can see the art, and it's 2D, and it's hanging on the wall, and it's great, and then you can pop on the glasses, and oh, everything changes. So we're working on, on, on that. And in the meantime, Bradford Stewart and I are working on our ballet. Um, I conceived the idea of projecting his paintings onto these ballet dancers, uh, three dancers who are uh, on the Mylar sort of background, um, who are performing uh, classical ballet on point uh, with a sort of fusion type soundtrack and sort of Brad's like really great sort of urgent graphics. Um, projected on, on, on the dancers and it, 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 the, the results we got actually were stunning. We didn't expect quite as much that we got. Um, so now we're going to expand that and sort of turn it into uh, you know a 20 minute short and see if we can sort of get it into the museums because I think it's one of the nicest things I've ever done. So anyway the piece is called uh, Ballet in Abstract you know because uh, as a sort of you know because of you're using Bradford Stewart's you know wonderful paintings and the music was composed by um, Bob Luna who is a you know is a brilliant composer and it was mixed by Val Goray, who is like a very, very famous producer and uh, engineer. And so the whole thing came together as a, just an experiment, just to see how much fun we could have. Uh, because of my ballet background, my royal ballet background, I just wanted to do something that did not have a client attached to it. That would say, oh, I want my name bigger, or my logo is not the right color, or can you move this over here? I just wanted to put something together that was totally 100% exactly how I wanted it. And I'm my own worst enemy, I'm my own worst critic. So you can imagine, you know, I probably lost more sleep trying to make that thing work than, you know, most projects. <laughs>